your court agents. I live in Glasgow, and not just only staying on the inside. I thought it was highly interesting. Um, I am Libisa Gune. I work for the United Nations Development Trade Program in the Accelerator Lab. I'm the head of solutions mapping, and I will be the director of the program this morning. But to be back at the program for this morning should not take us beyond 1300 hours. Allow me to just take you through the program quickly. We will have the opening remarks. Whereafter, we will immediately launch the report. After that, we will have the panel discussions. And that will be leading us to the end of our program for today. The main purpose of this meeting this morning is to launch the Human Development Report and allow me to welcome you all to this meeting. The Human Development Report, affectionately coined HDR, is the United Nations Development Program flagship publication whose primary purpose is to foster human development globally and to create an enabling uh, environment for people to enjoy long, healthy, and creative lives. The two men of the to let you know that to date, more than 700 um, regional, national, and sub regional human development reports have been published by 143 countries, the vast majority of which are in Africa. Allow me at this juncture to invite the United Nations Development Program resident representative, Dr. Jacqueline Orea to deliver her opening remarks. Major Ki Mbe. Thank you, Dati. Jumela Bomele Bontate. Hi. Let's hear up a bit. The weather today is nice, right? Jumela Bomele Bontate. Yeah. That sounds better. Maybe um, you haven't had tea or coffee, that's why we are a bit dull. But when I look at your faces, I see smiles. So I think it's more the weather that makes you more to be. Um, I want to start off by paying my respects to His Majesty King Betty and his third, to the Right Honorable, the Prime Minister, Patricia Kapitani, to the President of the Senate, to the Right Honorable Speaker of the National Assembly, to His Lordship, the Chief Justice, to His Majesty's Cabinet. In particular, the Minister of Finance and Development Planning, who is a UNDP's key partner in this process that we are gathered for here today. I'd also like to pay my respects and recognize the presence here with us today of senior government officials, representatives from the diplomatic uh, organization, inter and international organization, the private sector, the media, the civil society, and all our partners who are gathered here today. When I look at the crowd, I also see a very a special category dear to my heart, the youth who are present here with us today. I really want to, I see a hand really there. Um, you're dear to us, you're dear to the development process of this country, and you're the, the stewards of uh, the issues that we're about to discuss today. So I'd really like to recognize your presence here. Having said that, um, most of you who have interacted with me know that I usually don't read speeches. But the reason we are gathered here today is so factual. There are statistics, there are data that is not only speak to the <coughs> context, but also to all the countries in which UNDP is operating in. So today, I'll move away from my usual stuff of speaking off the cuff to the issues that affect this country, refer to a speech that I have because of the nature of the issue, issue that we have. And as has been mentioned by my colleague, Mr. Terry Lebesa, um, the Human Development Report globally is undertaken by UNDP as a flagship program in all of the countries where we operate, um, 165 countries where we operate currently. 
And it gives us an opportunity to compare ourselves as Lesotho with the other countries globally, but also within our region. You will see shortly during the presentations that will be made here before the panel discussions, the, compar <laughs> the comparisons that we are making, um, whether it's on various <laughs> human development indices, whether it's education, whether it's literacy, whether it's health indicators, whether it's around environmental management and sustainability. You will see how we, as uh, the Kingdom of Lesotho, compare to other countries in the southern region, but also to other countries globally. Um, and also within that comparison, you'll see whether we are doing well as a country in terms of the progress that we are making on the various human development indices. Um, I must say that from my reading of the 2023-2024 Human Development Report, we as a country are making some progress in particular indicators. But we are also regressing in some indicators, and you will see the data and statistics uh, shortly. One of the things that really struck me when I was reading the information on the, in the report about Lesotho is the data gaps. The report globally is prepared by information that is provided by a number of entities, and that information comes from the country. You will see the gaps, but most importantly, you will notice that the data on environmental issues, the data on um, our carbon, um, you know, uh, footprint and so on are heavily lacking in the report for the SOTO compared to the other countries. So that data will be a gap when we are making the presentation. That to me speaks to the need for us as a country working together to ensure that we fill the gap, we provide the necessary data so that in future there is a true and objective comparison of what we are as a country compared to the countries in the sub-region and compared to the countries globally. Having said that, Bome Lebontate, allow me now to go to the formal speech, which, as I said, uh, deviates from my usual practice, but because of the facts and figures, I'd like to focus on the same. Um, the UNDP formally launched the Global Human Development Report in 1990, and at that point in time, the theme of the report was concept and measurement of human development. The focus here is on the last two words, human development, because it enables us to see the challenges as well as the progress uh, that we are making, but also come up with solutions that would help us um, address those challenges. In this regard, the Human Development Report aims to generate debate on important issues of development, if necessary, raise awareness, alert leaders to the threats, and address and highlight appropriate measures that need to be taken. The Human Development Report shows the progress made by countries, as I've mentioned, <coughs> the disparities that exist between the different countries, and within that, highlights the various human development indices, which include the Gender Development Index, the Overall Human Development Index, Inequality Adjusted Human Development Index, Gender Inequality, which is different from Gender Development Index, Multidimensional Poverty Index, Gender Social Norms Index, as well as what I mentioned earlier, the planetary, about the environment, that one. We have the global one, which has a different theme, and then every country is also expected to develop one at the national level, um, and the topics or the themes for those ones are agreed to between ourselves. So do not tire when we call you. It is for the benefit of this great kingdom that we'll be calling upon you for that particular initiative as well. I thank you, and I hand it back to Tate Lebes. Thank you very much, Major Key. May I kindly request Major Key to remain standing as I invite the Director, Department of Planning from the Ministry of Finance and Development Planning for Major Key to hand over the report as a gesture of the launch, whereafter Neymar Lifu will continue with, the, with, with her remarks on behalf of the Ministry. John Payne. Global Human Development Report, which will now be gladly and with all pleasure hand over to the government.
Thank you very much, Bombay. Um, my name is Memalifu Hanyapo. I'm the director in the Department of Monitoring and Evaluation in the Ministry of Finance and Development Planning. I'm here standing on behalf of my Honorable Minister to present her remarks today, as she is not available to, to be with us today. She has traveled uh, on some other agent businesses. So today I would like to first of all, pay my respects to His Majesty King Lizia III, the Right Honorable the Prime Minister, Honorable President of the Senate, Speaker of the National Assembly, Your Lordship President of the Court of Appeal, Ladyship the Chief Justice, or oh, I'm sorry, Lordship, yeah, uh, Lordship the Chief Justice, <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, Honorable Deputy Minister, Honorable Ministers, Judge of the High Court, Honorable Members of the Council of State, Excellencies Head of Diplomatic Missions and Head of International Organizations, Honorable Members of Parliament, Government Secretary, Principal Secretaries, Senior Government Officials, Heads of UN Agencies and Diplomatic Missions, Heads of Parastatals, Private Sector, Civil Society Organizations and the Media, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen. Um, ladies and gentlemen, let me first of all start by thanking UNDP Lesotho and more specifically Dr. Jacqueline Olewa, the UNDP resident representative for organizing this auspicious event, the launch of the Human Development Report 2023-24, themed the breaking the gridlock and reimagining cooperation in the polarized world. I would like to first of all try to make an to try to understand what do we mean by polarization. When we talk about the polarized world, I'd like to say polarization can simply be defined as the act of dividing something, especially, um, yeah, it's like, as the act of dividing something that contains different people or, or opinions into two complete, completely opposing groups. In this instance, we may look at the polarized world through the lens of highly developed rich countries and underdeveloped, which are poor countries, and how it affects cooperation. The polarization of the world into rich and poor can clearly be seen in many forms, such as political instability, inequalities between countries, and so on. Sadly, we are living in a highly polarized world. We are at an unfortunate crossroad where polarization and distrust are on a collision with an ailing planet. Insecurity and inequalities are the major players. Our institutions are struggling to keep up with evolving, deepening forms of global interdependence and provide global public goods. Polarization is a big part of this problem. So are narrow and self-fulfilling assumptions about human behavior that limit it to self-interest. Polarization at the national level has global consequences. It is a drag on international cooperation, including for the provision of global public goods. Since 1990, 90 human development reports have highlighted critical dimensions of human, human progress and sustainable development, thereby informing, encouraging, and assisting governments and stakeholders to address the impediments in a way of enlarging choices. The measure for human development through health, education, and standard of living has served as use, useful resources and shaping development policy, including for Lesotho. The 2023-24 Human Development Report starts to mold what 
could be called an emancipatory vision of development that highlights the grand challenge of our time, which is people and planet in joint crisis. This takes on development, this take on development evolves around the expansion of the intersection of human development, human rights, and sustainability. The report points us to the relationship between humans and nature and highlights the treasury, the treachery and impact of human activity. It has shaped ideas and development discourse, especially for social development in many countries. Ladies and gentlemen, although Lesotho, Lesotho's ranking has moved only slightly since 1990, the human development ranking and index have always been the radar for social development policy. I'm quite pleased to report that the government of Lesotho over the years has introduced policies and programs that significantly change the status quo on education, health, and status of living. The compulsory and free education for all policy enabled Lesotho to achieve near par parity in primary education and enrollment for boys and girls. Investments in health have tremendous, tremendously reduced the infant and maternal mortality rates and importantly increased access to health services, especially in the rural communities. And lastly, through the social protection and public works program in the Ministry of Social Development and Ministry of Environment and Forestry, we are able to mitigate income inequalities and help families to meet basic livelihoods needs. Lesotho is commu committed to ensuring gender equality and social inclusion and ensure full, equal, and meaningful participation of women, children, youth, and marginalized communities. This is another principle we have maintained in our development policy and program implementation to ensure human agency in development. Ladies and gentlemen, as we get into today's deliberations, I challenge you to also think about how we can together join hands to implement the ambitions to attaining development, while also keeping an eye on the impact of the nature of nature COVID-19 has shown us that radical changes are possible with commitment and joint vision. Improving the Sotos Human Development Index from the current 0.52 to 0.64 by 2026-27 remains one of our biggest concerns. While we navigate the current pandemic, we cannot let business remain as usual the report is a call to pursue entirely a new path that all countries, societies, and economies must adapt, adopt to save humanity from unforeseen crises and dooms. Um, the Ministry of Finance and Development Planning is concluding the elaboration of the extended NSDP 2, which it will enable us to put our best foot forward. The most reassuring path to building back better is considering the SUTU's development targets and the crisis that COVID-19 has plummeted us into. We have lost a lot, but in the context of this human development report, Deploying sustained action against mechanisms of social norms and values, incentives and regulations, and nature-based human development will deliver us and our planet. As I conclude, I also want to note that Lesotho has not taken full advantage of the human development approaches to interrogating its development agenda. I make a commitment here today that we at least within the current NSDP period, will publish two Lesotho National Development Human Reports, including the one that is currently under preparation and at the final uh, stages of completion. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to conclude by passing my sincere appreciation to all of you. 
for your commitment to the development of this country and acknowledge the support of development partners as well as other donor agencies, resident and non-resident, and both national and new international organization agencies. I also wish to thank UNDP for its support to the Kingdom of Lesotho through its various programs and as government, we look forward to more future years of cooperation. Um, Ladies and gentlemen, this is uh, the end of the remarks that I have I'm delivering for um, on behalf of the Honorable Minister of Finance and Development Planning, Hotso Pulanala. Thank you very much, my manager, and the report will be to you. Okay. Maso Pribaka, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, may I kindly request that we take a 15 minutes health break as we rearrange our room for the next session. And you are also invited to tea and coffee at the back of this room. Maso Pri. <laughs> I am advised that Dr. Oloya will be leaving this room. So before she leaves, we would like to have a photo of the launch here before she could leave this room. If we go through the calculation, we have the three indices and we have the aggregate indices, which is the HDI Human Development Index which is the geometric average of the three and the Yes, then uh, we can say that we have a permanent loss on human development over the war since 1919. Uh, as the RR said already, UN, UNDP resident representative, the human development report was launched in 1919. The first from 1919 to this year, we have uh, 31 report because there are some report who are covering uh, two years, like this report 2020 to and uh, we have also the report on 2006 2007, which is covering COVID. We can see that the difference is also begin to be very high. Then. This is a conclusion that we are left behind. The developed countries are recovering better than us after the COVID-19. And it's very important to know it because yes, we have the explanation. They are leading on the international threat and we'll see it on the panel discussion that we're going to be addressed by the representative of the Minister of Trade. Hmm? Uh, Technology. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, then uh, you can see the consequences of this uh, human following of grid lock. I said that we have a huge difference between the developed countries, namely the OECD countries and other European and uh, American countries, and the other side, the least developed countries are ours. <laughs> you can see here that on the left side, that we have the fatalities in state-based conflict. It's growing up. You see, here. Is growing up from 2019 to there. Now, we have a lot of conflict over the world. We have a lot of national conflict for which we have a lot of facilities over the world. And for this conflict also, and all the disparities that we have over the world, we have a lot of displaced people. We can see that this is very challenging. It's growing up, it's displaced people in million. It's around one. 110 million of people that have been displaced. 
if you see from the beginning, it's very, very low. And then it's going up over the international and national conflict that you are having over the world. Very challenging. Thank you. Then, uh, this is very important also to know. Uh, as the report said, this uh, human grid load is very, very challenging for all the people. You can see that first, if you start, five from 10 of people that that's about the world people report, not being in control of their own lives. It's over the world. You can tell about yourself. I don't know if you are controlling your own life. <laughs> <laughs> and you can see also a concerning voice in political system. 68% of people report that they are not having, they have little influence on the decision of their government. Seven of ten people. You can also tell about yourself. Thank you. Go. Continue. I can tell also about myself. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. Then uh, this insecurity and closely linked to polarization is being observed to two of the countries showing increase in polarization. We have this Arab. <laughs> The polarization is very, very challenging in this Arab state. You can see, of course, that there are countries with non democracy, a lot of challenge, and so on, so on, with a lot of inequalities where uh, we have uh, people who are benefiting from the fuel and so on. But if you see Sub Saharan Africa from where we are, we can see that also the polarization and the security is growing up. And it's very, very challenging. We come from the low polarization and grow up to the medium high, and then go up to the very high polarization. Just sub Saharan African countries come after the Arab third countries, and you can see that the polarization and the insecurity within people is lower in developed countries and also in Asia, you have these countries you can see here. These are developed countries in black. Yes. We agree more than we think the report is saying. Easy polarization. We have a lot of percentage. And you know when uh, they are drafting the UN Development Report Office when they are drafting this uh, report 2023 2024. They spent two years because the report that is very important. So, why do you have this report for two years 2023 2024? They have made a lot of surveys over the world, there are a lot of countries, I don't know, <coughs> maybe, yeah. But you can see that the perception is, is very bad. 43% of the world's population willing to make personal financial commitment to payment action. They need it. And we have also the reality of the 69% of the world's population willing to make personal financial commitment to payment action. Payment action is becoming very challenging. And on this kingdom, which has a lot of mountains region, we know that the climate action is very, very challenging. Because I remember that I attended three or four months ago a World Bank presentation at this hotel. But when we see the last expectancy up there, here and there, we can see that it has a perfect correlation. They are quite parallel. This is correlation, is that equal to correlation. They are perfectly parallel with the HDI. This is the HDI. The HDI, the evolutionary trend, is the same with the left, but the CRP. Nothing to say, but 
you can see that we have three global trends concerning the human development and tax evolution trend in the level of From 1992 to 2006, we have this decline trend. From this period, we lost six years of life expectancy at the 16 years. Yes, from year to year. But we are recovering from 2007 year to before uh, just uh, the pandemic effect, COVID pandemic effect. From 2006-7 to 2021, we are recovering. And we gain six years of life at this moment. But since 2020, uh, 2021, we are in the COVID pandemic effect because the pandemic uh, effect came after 2020. The effect, uh, the pandemic is 2020, but we observe a lot of this gap has decreased the life expectancy at birth slowly for, I think, uh, two or three years. Uh, in 2021, and also it declined on 2022, the last year. Now we are about 50 years of life expectancy at that. Then you can see also for 1919 to 2022, we have lost life expectancy at that. You are still under the value of. 20, 20 uh, of net net, which is about, I think, uh, seven, uh, five, uh, 59 years, something like this. And exactly 2022, we will have 63 years of life at the uh, see of birth. If you have passed these years, you can be happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, come, come back. Come back. Please. <laughs> also, what is challenging is here on the yellow, the GNI per capita. We have a good value of GNI per capita, which is $2,700 per capita per person. This is, means that all of us can spend, can be able to spend this and others, this, from this morning. But what is very challenging is that the GNI per capita has been very, very volatile. You can see. Very, very volatile. The GNI per capita is dependent on the economic growth and dependent on the transfer that we have on the capital assets. It's dependent on the GDP and on the transfer, international transfer, what comes over and what comes outside. And then, you can see, no, no, I didn't finish. I have to answer. <laughs> I have to raise a challenge. Uh, we have 2,700 GNI per capita this year, last year. Uh, excuse me, 2000, uh, 2022. But this GNI level is the same in 1998. This is very challenging. This means that the countries have stagnated over 25 years. Can you imagine that we have the same GNI view with this common consumption that we have now with our parents who are living in 1998? It's not fair. We have to do better. Go. <laughs> Uh, I raise it because I want you to have discussion around <laughs> this. This is our own. Thank you very much. Then if you compare, I not compare, I already compare, you can see that I compare, uh, I say that Zimbabwe, a uh, medium uh, human development that is uh, from 0.55%, Zimbabwe is the best on the, this, and this, as you can see. But we are uh, doing better on other countries. Uh, we are doing better than Malawi. Even even I have a friend from Malawi will not be happy. <laughs> 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 that 
<laughs> of course, I see. Uh, but uh, you know that this is a comparison uh, with the low human development countries, with the sub Saharan countries, and uh, with these developing countries. Go, because uh, I talk a lot, and I have to be. Then I said that uh, now we finish with the Women Development Index, which is focusing, focusing with, on which government are focusing politically because we lost uh, ranking so and so on. I didn't say, but uh, Lesotho is ranking 106 out of 193 countries. 160 out of 100. 93, 93 countries over the world. Yes. Then uh, we go uh, through the other human development indicators. You have human development index, but we have also other human development indicators. Uh, our panelists will be talking about the gender development index, but the gender development index is just the ratio of the female to the male human development index. You have the female human development index and you have the male, male women development index. You can see that in uh, in uh, this year 2022, the female human development index is here and the male is here. But you remember the global index is 0 0.521. Then, uh, female are doing, uh, men are doing better than women. You have this gap which is negative, but it's a few gap. You can see that the gap is not very important, considering, for example, Rwanda, on which country, which we are talking. People are saying, Rwanda, Kagame is based on gender equality and so on, so on, but we are doing better than uh, <laughs> Rwanda, for example. Even if you can, I can tell, you know, I can tell by my international experience. I just come here in this country, but when I go through the Ministry of Finance and Development, it's a very good thing, but all the PS minister and then the director, they are all female. It's a very good thing that is, means that you are doing better, you are doing very good <laughs> on this. Yes, you are doing very good. If I, I will take it over my country, we are doing very good on this. You know, if you go, uh, tell, uh, give responsibilities to a female, I think that they are doing better than us. It's my own opinion. Okay, you can go. Then the second, the third, as you can say, after the Human Development Index and the Gender Development Index is the Inequality Adjusted Human Development Index. This adjusts the Human Development Index for inequality in the distribution of its dimension according to the population. You have the loss in the Human Development Index to the inequality, which is the difference between the HDI and the HHDI. And you can see that the loss is very important in the laser talk as is also important in South Africa and Zimbabwe. But we are the, these two countries that are doing better because the Gini index is very important in the country. You know, the Gini index, even it's high, is indicating the greater inequality. In Lesotho, we have Gini index about uh, 46%. Yes, uh, it's uh, from 2000, it's from 2017. They are not calculating in the Gini index for uh, every, any year. Uh, the Gini index is calculating uh, with the, what you call the census. And the census uh, is uh, being made in any country in at least 10 years, even in developed countries. I think we are preparing now the next census. But the Gini index that we had, Last year is for 2017, it's 46%. But in Eswatini, for example, it's 56%. It's right like that. And yeah. Yes. Then you can see that we have this loss of human development going to inequalities. It was on 20, on uh, 12, 44%. Uh, uh, but it's decreasing because, as I said, here we have a lower Gini index. 
and you can see that this is decreasing for a year. It's on 2017 that we have the new value of the Gini index. But before 2017, it was about 50%. Because of this Gini index that is declining, we have this difference from the human development and, uh, and this is so lost, that is lower. And this is very encouraging also for the country. Well, and then at least each other in the no, not at least we, we remain the MBR. Uh, we have the gender inequality index, on which is the RR as well. The gender inequality index, we are assessing gender inequalities in three key dimensions reproductive health, measured by the maternal mortality ratio, and the adolescent birth rates. Women empowerment share of the parliament seats held by the woman and the population of at least from secondary education by each gender. And the third uh, dimension is labor market participation for both uh, women and men. Then the lower, if we have lower GI, values this represent a better performance regarding gender inequality. We have the, in Lesotho, this, that is 51%. And you can see that is lower than uh, what we get in the other countries. And, uh, but over the world, we have better than in Lesotho in our country. But I said that the lower GI values represent a better performance regarding the gender inequality. Then you can see that what is very challenging is what I highlighted in red. We have the three dimensions on which we have the indicator, but what is very challenging is about the maternal mortality ratio and the adolescent birth rates. You can see that they are very, very challenging. This is why I highlighted it. Yes. Okay. This is has some implication on policies recommendation. We can go. Then we are finishing with the MPI, multi-dimensional poverty index. You know, poverty is not only about uh, revenue. It's not only about uh, what you call the poverty line that we are sitting in the country. So we have international poverty lines. For example, for uh, low middle income countries like Lesotho, what you call low middle income countries is this GNA coming from 1,100 uh, 1, per year. For these countries, yes, we can see that the poverty line set by the international poverty line, the poor, we have 33.4% of people that are living under the poverty line. This means that if you consider, we have 32% of Basoto who are living <coughs> under this poverty line, which is two point fifteen dollar per day by people. You can tell about yourself. Certainly you are living <laughs> with more than this. Okay. Then you can see uh, this a multidimensional poverty index. It identifies multi-deprivation at the household level in three dimensions with 10 indicators globally. And it concerns seven SDGs. Uh, the first dimension is about health. We are considering on each nutrition, child mortality. Education, second dimension, we are considering years of schooling, school attendance, which are very good in our country and standard of living, which is very challenging. We are considering cooking, fuel, sanitation, drinking water, electricity, housing assets, and so on. Housing assets is well, television, and so on, so on, so on. Okay, but you can see that we are doing good compared to, compared to if you compare it to other countries, we are doing relatively good. But the most deprivation in Lesotho 
are about the standard of living. This is the 60%. This means that the multi poverty, the multi dimensional poverty, excellent in Lesotho, was 68% by the standard of living. We are losing a lot of things on the standard of living, which are here cooking food, sanitation, drinking water, electricity, housing assets. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sulima, uh, for such an informative, uh, comprehensive presentation. Mafem Pribaka, Dr. Suleiman is the Senior Economic Advisor at UNDP Lesotho and the Kingdom of Eswatini. Um, so you will have a chance to have interactions on these issues in the next session and to stir conversations around these matters uh, for all of us at least to be able to, to craft the craft of better. It is now my pleasure, Mafem Pribaka, to invite Dr. Tamiso Nyaba Nyaba, who will lead uh, the session uh, of the panel uh, discussions, where after we'll go into recommendations and finalize the program uh, for today. Ntate Nyaba Um Also, allow me, Klebo Melundat, for all the speakers, please be aware that we are using directional microphones and they don't pick sound at, uh, on the side. So we'll have to speak directly into the microphone. Thank you very much. As indicated, my name is Tati Sonia Banyaba. I come from the National University of Lesotho. I've been requested to do a very simple job. It can be simple, but it can be complicated. It's a very simple job. Um, where I'm supposed to simply ask questions. It's unfortunate, but so talk about Baabatlam, who complicated in tow, will ask our children to read uh, the history the, uh, of the person who's just passed away and they struggle with Sesotho, uh, and the old ladies will correct the Sesotho. We have high literacy. I'm sure you would have read the questions and you understand them. But I'll read them for you. And after that, the panelists will come and uh, uh, engage with those issues. Uh, I'll explain this after I have called them onto the stage. Uh, all protocols, and go straight to the program. Uh, Mère le wili, le me mato manto pi, linda tempeche. Ko pali tle kitsbo ko intro juice. Kitsbo zo ba pi. Ladies and gentlemen, um, as I said, my job will be relatively simple. If my panelists uh, are comprehensive, my remarks will be very short. And I hope they will be as comprehensive as I expect them to, and I know them to be. Uh, I hope you two will also be cooperative. Please don't represent. Uh, you can make inputs, you can ask questions, but don't present again because you will complicate my job. Because I'll have to say, please stop for the sake of others to also have a contribution. So try to be as succinct as possible if there are inputs. You can always engage with them afterwards and direct them to further information. But for the sake of uh, progress, let's do that. Um, I am, as I said, uh, the panel will, the panelists will have 15 minutes presentation. I come from a mathematics uh, background, so I'll be very precise. 15 minutes will be 15 minutes. It will not be near. It will be that. And I know they have prepared, they have looked at the questions and therefore they will stick to that. And I'll stick to that. Um, and then that will allow for us to interact with this. And after that, you'll have your chance. And uh, I'll make very brief remarks, I promise you. Um, 
Now, um, you, I'll move straight into the program uh, so that we are able to get the benefit of the time that is left to fully engage in these issues uh, that have been so illuminating from the celebratory uh, events in the morning to the illuminating presentation by Dr. Booker uh, this, um, this, uh, just now. So we have a list of questions and I'll introduce this uh, panelist as I ask them to talk to the question that is there. We are going to start on the issues related to, um, to government in particular uh, on the Human Development Report. And I'm going to be assisted by Mr. Lebeko Silo uh, from the Ministry of Information, Communications, Science, Technology, and Innovation uh, to help me and help us understand the role of uh, government, particularly in this area of uh, knowledge and technology, which are critical to human development, how the government of Lesotho is addressing the access to digital public infrastructure for greater equity in harnessing new technologies for equitable human development. That day, Silo, you'll have, um, as I said, 15 minutes to uh, inform us on how you see this unfolding with government and then thereafter I will engage uh, with the panel. Please uh, go ahead. I'll, what I will do is um, at about five minutes left, I'll just try to catch your attention. But when two minutes left, you'll see me standing coming here, then you know that uh, you need to be rounding up. Uh, please go ahead, Nati. <laughs> Number one, the report that has just been presented says I should have died in around 2020. <laughs> uh, and I'd, I'd like you to internalize that and let that sink in because you are the younger ones so you, you should be looking at whether you can change that number uh, number two I want to share two quotations with you so before he takes me off the stage remind me to share the second one I'm going to share the first one the first one is from a friend of mine uh, Dr. Mansika Matuani who, before she became Dr. Matuane and was not yet 20, said, uh, I have lived in a developing country all my life, far too long for a country to be developing. Surprisingly, we are still here where countries are developing. Uh, but now that I've said that which was not on this note, let me dive straight into what the government of Lesotho is looking at. Uh, the government of Lesotho has always considered technology to be important. They've always considered specifically information technology to be important. And in this regard, they have gone through two visible phases. One was to set up a, a new government infrastructure project twice. Uh, the first one achieved certain things that it achieved. I will talk very little about it. But they are working on a second one now, which ends in 2025. But this project has four main goals. One, improve access to broadband uh, in rural and unserved areas. You will all agree with me that most of the areas in the urban part have been sorted. Uh, to improve access to digital financial uh, infrastructure uh, across the country. That is to say, you should be able to send money or to pay for things without taking money somewhere else. That's digital financial infrastructure. 
to improve access to digital government uh, services, uh, to say you should be able to interact with your government without having to present yourself at the government office, and to improve the policy environment in which all of these things happen. So this is the project that I'm working on, that I'm leading. And it has very simple, concrete goals. One of them, improve access to broadband. The project is supposed to build uh, 48 additional towers in the rural areas so that you know, we have better connectivity out there and we can send those people uh, mobile money and they can uh, use that where they are. Uh, we are supposed to improve the robustness and resilience of our connectivity. One of the last places that remain not connected, or how do I put it, that is not connected, connected as it should be, is the district of Tarasek. So towards this district, the government is uh, rolling out a uh, fiber optic cable uh, that links Tarasek uh, to Roma. Roma is very well connected to Maseru, so you start in Roma going to Tarasek. And then we plan to expand access to digital financial services. This says improve the reach of your EcoCash, your Pesa, all of those improve the reach of the post bank. Uh, develop a strategy and platform that allows the government to reach particularly the youth where they are. I stopped watching linear television. I don't know whether you know what I mean by linear television. So I'll, I'll explain very briefly. Linear television is where you all gather at eight o'clock to watch some show because it happens to be there at eight o'clock. So I stopped watching linear television about 10 years ago. So I watch television what I want, when I want. Most of you are the same, especially the younger ones. You will pause it, you'll watch it when you want. But government still reaches out to you via radio Lesotho, via TV Lesotho, in a linear manner. If you are not there and you haven't heard, then they've not reached out to you. So government is saying, we actually need to look at the strategy for talking to the youth at their terms, at their time. Uh, we need a strategy that takes us from being an analog nation, where we're still using paper and everything else to transact business, to being digital being digital in how we think and how we do things. So we need a strategy for doing so. I'm pleased to announce that uh, government has actually developed such a strategy. I will talk about it a little more later. Uh, we need to revisit what the post office is and what it does. I think what, that most of you may have not sent a letter. Uh, Surprisingly, when you apply for university, you are still required to send a letter, a skill that you are likely to ever need. Uh, so the post office, in its own way, has become a relic of the past. So we need to review and revitalize the post office and to see how it transforms and meets the needs that we have now. Uh, so this is one of the things that we are doing. The Central Bank of Lesotho has interestingly licensed uh, mobile money. They say you can use a card to pay. Uh, so they have all these digital channels. Who's ever paid government digital? So you go to a government office and digital money stops. You're supposed to bring cash. So I used to work at LEC. Now every office of LEC is within 100 meters of, a, of an ATM. All of them across the country have looked. So you were required to go to the ATM, take out money, pay LEC. In the evening, LEC takes the same money and takes it back to the bank at a cost. Government still does the same. So we're looking at working on uh, something called the repayment gateway to allow governments to be paid digitally and to also provide payments digitally. Uh, now, we are also looking at what are the things that we can work on 
so that you do not have to come to government offices. And these are called uh, e-services. I'm not going to go into which ones we are looking at, but we are looking at those services to say, how do we improve those services? Uh, but the question that Dr. Nyabanyaba posed, one of them was, he used the words digital public infrastructure. Digital public infrastructure is very simple. If you think of physical public infrastructure, if I tell you about roads and bridges and electricity, you can relate to those. Digital public infrastructure says, what are the things that are similar uh, that are in the digital realm? Uh, one of them is the issue of identity. Uh, identity is we should know who we are talking to. Now, the custodians of identity in the Soto uh, the National Identity and Civil Registry. Uh, most of you just call them home affairs. Uh, they're the custodians. What have they done? They have gone and assigned identity. Please, let's be careful. Assigned identity to over 85% of us. So I didn't say they gave IDs to over 85% of us. They've assigned identity. This means that a child that is born now has an identity number. So that's assigning identity. If you are over the age of 16, you are supposed to have an ID card. And it is actually a criminal offense not to have one. It is also, for the civil servants in here, an offense to serve somebody you don't know. Go read the National Identity Act of 2011. It's number 16 of that act. It makes it an offense to serve somebody you don't know. So to make sure that we know who the people are, the government of the Soto has fingerprinted those over the age of 16 and assigned ID cards, which means now these people have a number. We also have a unique biometric identifier that talks to who they are, which means that we can now move to step two to say, because we know who these people are, we can start working out what services they need so that services go to people. So the first fundamental building block of digital public in infrastructure is identity. So now that we know who the people are, we can now expect money from them in terms of uh, tax and non-tax revenue. We can also send money to them in terms of grants, whether it be old age pensions, whether it be salaries, whether it be anything else. So payments is now the second building block of digital public infrastructure. Now, going back to identity, uh, government started on this project a while back. As I say, the, National, the ID Act was 2011, one from 2004. And I've talked to 85% of people being on this. Now, the next step is how do we continue to make this information that we've collected ours? How does it help other people in Lesotho to offer service? Government has been offering ID verification services to industry. They've offered them to banking sector, or let me just call them the financial sector. Uh, they've offered those services where they're saying, when you go, we should be able to know who you are so that we offer those services to you. They've offered the services to you uh, in also the SIM card registration and so on. So th th they've dealt with identity. They have dealt with the or oh, they are dealing with the issue of payments. I've talked to the project that I'm leading, which is going to do an e-payment gateway. So that talks to the issue of payments and how we handle payments. We've had the first consultative workshop and we've concluded that we're going to go ahead and handle payments. Uh, then the third issue is broadband infrastructure. There should be those towers out there that we connect to. So the towers out there, government committed to, in the first phase of the project, to building 10, they did. In the second phase of the project, they committed to building 48. 26 were committed, uh, completed last year. We are going to build 18 starting in May this year. So broadband infrastructure is being built. The line to Tabab, which I talked about, is also uh, being built. 
Uh, then in terms of the police environment, cabinet has met, chosen and made the decision to say the minister responsible for communications is also the government of Lesotho's chief digital officer and they should drive these innovations and that they should have a serious look at the security aspects that affect or that drive this uh, digitization uh, initiatives. Now, this, in short, is uh, what the government of Lesotho has been working on. Now, I promised a quotation uh, at the end. A long time ago, there was an Englishman called Ambrose Bierce. He wrote something called the Devil's Dictionary. You may have come across it, you may not have. I would urge that you look it up. Uh, but it defines future as that period in time in which our affairs prosper, our friends are true, and our happiness is assured. Uh, I would like to live in that method. Thank you. Thank you very much, Nadesilo. Um, I would have been disappointed if someone in communications did not seem to be well read and uh, able to give us pointers to where, especially the youth could go on and find more information. Thank you very much for that. Uh, it's a service to the country. Um, I also really enjoyed the mix of um, typical government official patting on the back of government progress with some very in, uh, illuminative intricacies of uh, where some of the contradictions might be. And it is now up to you as uh, uh, the audience to engage with this. We now live in a knowledge era. And what is important and uh, what is critical is how communication and technology enables that. Um, deep knowledge, uh, how our children and our population can begin to be more knowledgeable, not just at the, at face value, but deep knowledge. He talked about the uh, rollout of broadband, how we are falling behind, particularly in rural areas. We are doing well in urban areas. What does this mean for um, deep knowledge, especially in relation to issues such as education. Um, we are now able to transact easily across the country, but what about other very significant development issues? But that is up to you. Um, you now have a moment to engage with that decision law um, around some of your observations related to that and any questions that you might have. And I'll give him uh, a few seconds, if, if a minute, uh, if some of those raise something to respond to. Um, I have, uh, I'll have to pass around the mic because I was told that. Oh, thank you. Anyone? I'm, I'm. I don't want to go on. I said I want. That this has already made my life very simple. I don't think there's much that I need to remark on because this was very illuminative. So, please help me out here. Oh yeah, that day. I'll be on the lookout, particularly from this side, where I see lots of our, the country's future. Um, thank you very much for your presentation. My um, question is from yesterday's, uh, an observation from yesterday. Um, during the Human Development Report launch, we said, we noted that 0.81% of the people have computer ownership. And that was one of the reasons why the, that's one of the reasons why the development index, especially in terms of ICT was low. And then from the project you have spoken about that the government is working on, increasing the access to the broadband um, um, network here. So the thing is, they will, um, they are creating access for public infrastructure for that, but how is the youth able to access this infrastructure if they don't own the systems to develop themselves? So is there any project 
that is going to help youths, increase the number of youths that have access to a laptop or the computers, or is there any public infrastructure where people can go and it's the government's computers and maybe if they have assignments or something that they want to research, they can do that. Thank you. Um, Kiko Palace la ba la tava who be as a suit. It la it la fit is a high one for Kahana. Please feel free um, to ask in any question. While you are thinking about it, and maybe you are struggling to rephrase to rephrase it in English. Kiko uh, Pal, let me just take a couple of uh, questions and comments. And then allow Adesilo to respond to this. Please go ahead. Um, my name is Develo Kokome. I come from, or rather, I represent the Soto Tribune. Um, I'd first like to share Dr. Tabiso's sentiments of patting the government in the back and appreciate her, appreciating how far they've come. Now, my question is, seeing that we are trying to come up with more innovative and digital ways of doing things, when you spoke about the issue of identity, I would like to find out if the ministry is probably looking into ways of us having to identify ourselves rather than the normal uh, ID or passport means of identifying ourselves because it's very annoying to have to carry identity around. Um, Haria, the passport, talk about the ID, the ask, isn't there a way in which because I'm always carrying a cell phone, I'd have my ID card on my phone and have it scanned high fikamono as opposed to me having to carry the actual ID around because I guess I saw copy fell how do you know again? Kahola fell like that. We'll have the last question for this so that we can use this. Thank you, Dr. Nyawaya. My question is related to to her question. Another way that many people don't find comfortable with is that when companies uh, want to carry out the know your customer, uh, know your customer services, we, we are always requested to go to, to the chiefs. And it is very, it, it is not very good uh, going to the chiefs. Sometimes they are, they are not there, sometimes they, they come in late. It, so are there, are there any innovative ways uh, uh, to, to do that one? Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Nadia. Please. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so are dealing with youth here. Uh, uh, is mixing them up, but uh, very pertinent issues. Uh, okay, so, so let's deal with computer ownership. Uh, Government does not have a program specifically to improve computer ownership, at least none that I'm aware of. Uh, youth access to devices, government does not have such a project, uh, at least none that I'm aware of. However, remember that we have something called the Universal Service Fund. Uh, the Universal Service Fund says you are paying to set aside money that is supposed to help the country to become more digital. So in setting aside this money, what has happened is that we've moved this money around. We've taken the money from uh, urban areas and we've constructed towers in the rural areas to get to about a little over 98% uh, population coverage. Please note, I did not say land coverage. I said population. Uh, and I speak very deliberately. So we have over 98% population coverage. We are not trying to cover sheep. We are trying to cover people. Uh, so that says, that's the first step, that's access. The second step, which I omitted to talk about, was the issue of pricing. If you will agree with me that over the last 10 years, you've seen significant reduction in pricing for data and voice and everything else. 
So we said, let's look at access. Number four, it's let us repurpose the universal service funds to address youth needs. And where these youth needs are, some of these areas are your colleges of education, the National University of Minnesota, and so on. The Universal Service Fund has gone in those places to improve internet access in those places, to say where you have labs in those places, let us have them be more useful. And the fund is now saying, because I said we are a little over 98, or we're going to get there, it says we are going to have to now repurpose that fund to do certain things. This is your time for advocacy to say, what is it that you want that money to do? Uh, can I summarize your question as, are we looking at digital ID? Uh, I think the answer is yes. Uh, remember that for us to look at digital ID, we're going to look at the technology. We are changing the technology and how we do verification services. We are talking to something called the MOSIP Foundation, uh, M-O-S-I-P, you can look them up or the MOSI project to see what they do. We are in talks with them to say, how do we move our verification services to this open source MOSI platform, which has all these other building blocks. The thing that will slow us down is creating the legislation and the policy environment that allows for these things. Ideally, we should move to digital documents, all the way to driver's licenses and anything else should be digital. If we start this process digitally, it should end digital. The cabinet of Lesotho has approved four principles. One of this is digital by design. So cabinet has already said digital by design in May last year, across everything IT. So we are going there. Uh, it brings the issue of the chief's letter. There is nothing that is more difficult in everything I've tried to do in life, and I've done a lot of things, than sorting out the chief's letter. Uh, the technology to do this exists. It's called the uh, e-notary. Uh, we, we understand what an e-notary service means. Uh, for us to do this, we need to build something called PKI, public key infrastructure. For those people in here who understand computer science, it's a way of saying that the person who authorized this document is really the right person to authorize this document. So, or to authorize this payment or whatever else. For us to do e-payments, we need PKI. For us to do anything else, we need PKI. So when we do PKI, one of the things that we should look at is e-notary services. They are not, unfortunately, I'm not going to say they are, part of any project that currently has funding. We are looking at funding for new things, but it is one of the issues that are an impediment to trade. Uh, before that, uh, I need to remind you, the role of government is very simple. It is to create prosperity. And prosperity is you being healthy, to do what you want to do, you having the time to do what you want to do. Not to stand in a queue, not to do all of these other things that have nothing to do with what you want to do. And you should hold government to account for creating prosperity. Last one, please. Um, that this had made it possible for us to have, if you promise to be very, very, very brief, I'll allow you. That is a lot. Thank you for the elaborate presentation, my brother. You scared the hell out of me, man. That's a 13, 14 year old law that I wasn't familiar with. You are saying that uh, the civil servants that are in here, yourself included, are committing law. I mean, they are committing a crime when they serve us, members of the public, without as having IDs. And uh, you, you, you are saying that uh, it is also an offense for us. It's actually a criminal offense. <laughs> oh, okay. Thank you. Um, yeah, it is um, an offense not to, 
to, to have an identity. Now, I want to ask you, does this apply only for the uh, public sector? Because I, I hear you mention this uh, referring to the civil service. Uh, provision of services or acquiring services from the, uh, you know, from the public sector requires that I have an ID. That uh, whoever would be saving me um, have to uh, know that if I don't carry an ID, they are also committing a crime. Does that apply only in the public sector? Or even in the private sector as well. Uh, so I would like to ask you which is an anti gender based violence and pro education rights movement. I thank you. Very brief, please. I, I, I will be very brief in that. The law does not say civil servants, it says it is of an offense to serve somebody who ought to have an ID. And you do not, how do I put it? There are certain services that you're going to offer a person. Uh, let's deal particularly in the financial services. If you do not know who you are dealing with, you are committing an offense. It is not just civil servants. The law does not stop at civil servants. And it also says that your ID card cannot be defaced. Please go read the 2011 uh, Act. It's short. This one is number 16. Though. When you read, it's number 16. It says it. Th thank you very much, Nadesolo, for that. And uh, colleagues, uh, he's here. He will allow us to continue to engage uh, after this. Uh, uh, unfortunately, because of time, uh, you might want to approach him uh, afterwards because otherwise we will do injustice to the next presentations. Uh, the next presentation is uh, focusing on civil, service, civil, um, civil society, which uh, we all know is very central to democracy and all the, uh, the services that are provided for us. So in that regard, Memantopi, uh, will be talking to us uh, on the question that is central to opportunities uh, and uh, challenges. And the question which is what are the challenges and the opportunities to address inequity and poverty reduction in Lesotho? And Meman uh, Topi Libofo will be talking to us about that uh, from a civil society perspective. I again give you 15 minutes, Meman uh, Topi, and uh, we'll engage as usual as uh, you present. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Ndate. Um, good day, Bumelbundat. Did you melam Bumelbundat? Jumelam Bumelbundat. I, I want you to repeat because we are in the 200 years of revival of who we are. And I hope and I wish we would all be wearing the flag of Lesotho to really remind ourselves of who we are. I am very happy of what Sudadesolo said to say that the role of government is to create prosperity and he he also said we have to hold the government accountable and i'm saying this because sometimes when we speak as civil society of trying to hold government accountable then it, it looks like it is something wrong or it's an offense and yet we are actually doing what we are supposed to be doing. I, I was sitting there as Ndade was presenting the report, and the only thing that I could do there is to sit and cry. And it is because I'm wondering if our government is actually doing 
or creating prosperity or poverty. For people to, that they presented that there are three dimensions that we look into when we look at human development. He mentioned long and healthy life. He mentioned knowledge. He mentioned a decent standard of living. The very basic human needs are shelter. And let us think of shelter in Lusitu today. And shelter not in Maseru, but shelter for people out there. And think of those people last night when probably we added more blankets and think of whether they have those blankets. Those people who are supposed to have shelter, in the shelter, there's supposed to be food. We have been talking about and we know of our soil which is eroding as we see it and sometimes calling it as it passes through the rivers, the Orange River, because it is carrying the soil. And our people, because the technology in the desert law is not so advanced, they still depend on the soil to produce food. So you can just ask yourself, where does the food come from when we no longer have soil? In this shelter, in addition to food, you cannot have food if you do not have water, if you do not have sanitation, if there's no energy to cook that food. And as far as I know, more than 60% of the population in Lesotho is relying on biomass for cooking and heating. For cooking and heating. Which biomass? Which biomass and therefore which energy do people use? And our NSDP member Lufi says that we should know that energy is a grove enabler. So if people do not have energy, how are we expected to grow? Economically and otherwise. So these are the challenges that we have. To say, how are we expecting therefore people to have a decent standard of living when they do not have the basic needs. We cannot run away from the fact that our people out there, when we are sitting under the lights, they do not have energy even to light, even to study, in the, even the kids, I don't know, in the village where I come from, there's not even that biomass to light anything. Then how, what kind of um, standard of living do we have as a to end? Where are the people supposed to get this? And Dr. Salo was talking or when the, present, uh, the presentation was made, that one of the, the measures is knowledge. I'm like, we are here discussing this report. Is it going to reach to the people? Are the policies that we have reaching out to the people? When we want in the remaining five years to 2030, where we should have achieved the sustainable development goals. Do, do our people contribute to that? Do they have any knowledge at all? Is that fair to Basotho? Do they have the knowledge of the policies which we are holding, which we have in the desks at our workplaces? And how, 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 how do we want them to, to contribute to sustainable development? Then I would say that 
in, in, in short, the opportunities which we have are in the recommendations that we have, that have been presented, which it is not the first time we hear about them. Unfortunately, we, we write lots of reports, we do policies, we do all these things. Do we implement them? We don't. And I like the opportunity that we have for lives in the SDG number 4.7, it says development has to consider or it has to recognize contribution of the culture of the people. If we do not recognize the culture of the people, then we will continue to talk about because we do not want our culture to contribute to sustainable development. I am saying that I, I, I'm taking, I like the recommendations because one of the recommendations says dialing down political polarization through new government structures, but so to head structures which were working, the structures of chiefs and and unfortunately, that has been distracted. And we realize when we are stuck now in the political structures that we have, that we have to go back and let us, as we celebrate the 200 years, remind ourselves of who we are. That's where I see the opportunities lying for us to progress. Thank you very much, Neman Tobia, and uh, again, well done. Uh, wouldn't expect less from civil society uh, um, to punch hard. Uh, that is their, their role, uh, to keep us in watch. It includes even us, academia. Uh, we collect a lot of information from these interactions. Um, highlighting the challenges, uh, it's natural that uh, she leans more towards challenges. She's from civil society. Around basic needs, uh, provision of basic needs, uh, participation and implementation, that is what she needs to watch for. But I like that she recognizes the uh, uh, the opportunities available around uh, culture, indigenous knowledge in this era and where we are, and uh, also the highlight on progress and uh, what have been um, a regression in relation to uh, our reliance, over-reliance on natural resources and conventional energy. Colleagues, um, it's now your opportunity uh, to uh, engage. Uh, again, let me continue to stress um, uh, how brief it is, is how, how effective it will be. Thank you. Oh, thank you. I'm thank you very much. Please remember to introduce yourselves oh, as you. I'm from Minister of Gender, Youth, and Social Development. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, I just wanted to get a feeling from Matt about the issue of uh, pricing, especially in terms of uh, uh, the electricity and uh, some other commodities. As a civil society, what are you engaging with uh, the, the, the government? Because most of the prices are going higher and that leads to more inequality and creating poverty to those people who are already uh, struggling, especially those at the rural places. So can you get us a feedback on that if you are actually trying to engage with the government so that they can see that they are subsidizing those people who are already struggling? Thank you. Any other inputs, question? make 
Thank you so much for your um, presentation. My heart also bled um, from the presentations because it's not just Lesotho, but Africa, most of the time, our uh, poverty index is always at the base. And then just like um, Intertestory mentioned, the developed countries are always at the top and then we go lower. But my question is also in line with his, because you have given, you know the context. Most times the people know the problems. And then you talk about the fact that you're happy that now they, we should contribute to policy development. So in line with this question, what are your strategies? Do you have any platforms you have created on how you want to gather knowledge and then intercept with the government to say, we need this, what are you doing about it? So not just on electricity, but generally on shelter, on the different issues. Are there um, liaisons already between different stakeholders who can then bring the problem and present it and say, this is our plan, this is what we want, this is how you want us to support. This is how we want you to support us as a civil society. Thank you. Be represented. Yes, the few job opportunities that we have, they are represented in lower um, paying jobs. So much that if you look at the earnings, you'll find there's a difference of about a, um, a thousand maluti in the earnings between the women and the men. And sometimes you would even ask yourself, is it the differentiation? Is it in accepting and um, um, employing the women because we are not so represented? Considering women are so educated, one would think we'd have more jobs, but that clearly is not the case. Statistics that don't show that. And the jobs that are available for women, they are those that are low, um, the low paying. And for that reason, we still remain at um, very, we still remain very poor, generally, the women. But there could be other factors because women tend to engage in um, activities that are sometimes attributed as unpaid. We engage in a lot of activities that are not recognized, that are not paid. And when that happens, when the sharing is not so equal, it means uh, the women are not disadva are disadvantaged because they invest a lot of their time in work that could have been remunerated when in fact it is not. Hence, in this approach, I must say, it's linking us to our thinking of changing our, our thinking, changing our attitudes as well as our norms. When we think about um, how we need to do, um, activities that we undertake that are normally that could be shared by both say um, the women and the men you'll find for some reason in our household in those sectors where there is no payment suddenly those are the women's jobs so the men tend to have a disadvantage of resting more thinking more innovatively and creating more money um, compared to the women. Uh, I want to believe I've sort of addressed most of them. No matter who, you'll help me with the other one, right? Yeah, you want me. Thank you. Kikupa Rimperi referred that the who I Okay, yeah. Kunali ailing ya samo how mani guaka butuna libus head ya hola la hopo. Gassing is my name butuna libus head kiss sex. Yes, in gender. How quana had you? A gender kita vaya hona or classify with an isibeti if he. So how to put him aside? Who are the nisibeti aiza? Lemon name of a not him aside. Natanya vanyaba. Mewak. 
Kubani kile khaitedi yanda tayi. Kiso sutu si jalo. Kita badi rose lady responsibilities. But sex in a little rose zayon. Ellen the sex rose. Jo ale pampiring how fit or ki hole sex. That means you're interested in sex. Haki ho kisis. Eko ho wishring. Kubani gaza ona sex ki. Il ki ona tio ki ne ki reki la se le se tianza me. And especially how we talk gender, it's never, never conclusive. So how can we just let people get engagement? Dinner, gender, we keep it out of our mind. We don't let them. But we want to see their interior. We want to see their interior. I want to disagree, even at the end. I really appreciate your question. Your question is is very very vital because it is see a something to engage with. Uh, you may not get the answer that is uh, uh, in mathemat in mathematics. We always get to the right answer uh, in most cases, but in social and uh, sociological issues, we never get to the right answer. Thank you very much. Kikupafa that day silo ten seconds. To address one thing, the alien guy visa, and then I hand back to that day. Tell me what. There was a question, a very interesting question about towers not covering uh, the people who grow more hair. Uh, and I said, we are covering people, not sheep. I specifically and deliberately said that. Now, you need different technology to cover those kind of areas. Uh, there's something called LoRa, uh, long range wireless area networks that we should be looking at to cover those areas. So that's a different technology for that kind of application. But I think what I'd ask to respond to was the issue of uh, electricity and electricity pricing. Let me indicate very quickly that <laughs> pricing for, and I've now taken off my head as a civil servant. So I'm now staying in that side. Let, let me indicate very quickly electricity pricing is exogenous it comes from outside we import electricity and until we create and generate our own electricity we will import the inefficiencies from outside all of them right now where we speak we are spending about 800 million to send outside paying for electricity that we bring into the so that money could be in the sort this information is on Lewa's website. LEC files a report. Wasco files a report that indicates they use all the water they generate. Please read these things. I said I have taken off the civil servant head. Thank you. Ten seconds. As we increase the inequalities and poverty in this country, Segin <laughs> Because in a country where the king is the champion of nutrition, making a land that they extension workers and whoever more than one to Despite my spectacular failure to uh, I enjoyed this session. It was very informative, making the wheel this opportunity. I thank you very much. Thank you very much, Gabinya Banyaba. And our panelists, thank you very much for your time. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your inputs, comments, and questions. Uh, as we move towards the end of the session today, let me also thank uh, Mema Tau for educating me today that Malumewaka could be Mewaka and that it will be Malumewaka.
Uh, ladies and gentlemen, as we close today's session, allow me to invite Mema Lefu Khanyapa to just give us a forward-looking remark and then close the session for today. Mema Lefu. Um, we have had a very good session today. We are going to launch this very important report. As much as the report Eloa is a global report, it's an initiative we have the United Nations because for that they have a global, they are wearing a global lens when they are looking at human development. But now we know that as a country, we actually fit into this particular report. So our question would be then how do we move forward to make sure that these challenges that are facing the whole world, uh, us as a country, how do we specifically deal with them at our own level? So we know that we have our MSDPs and we have seen that all the issues that have been discussed in this report, they do appear in our MSDP. So us as stakeholders, us as the people who are the key players in making sure that the economy of Lesotho develops very well, what are our roles and responsibilities? And I think we know them as they are assigned in sectors, according to the sectors and according to the mandates of the different uh, key players in the uh, development of the country. So as we move from here, let's also look back at what was discussed today to say, okay, while I'm in this particular sector, the health sector, and globally, these are the challenges. So my challenges, how do I also make sure that I address them such that we are at par with the whole world? Because as much as we would say, we might say, we might look at us and say that we are developing, but if we compare with, with other nations globally, we are not anywhere near developing. So that is why we normally, at uh, most of the time, we have to also look at ourselves in comparison with what is, ex is, is happening in the whole world. So I don't have much to say really. And we have had so much to discuss and I've learned quite a, a lot of things of which I'm also going to consider in my own office, sitting on my desk, to say this is what I learned today. This is what I learned globally and now as Mosutu in my own country, in my own office, Kili a key stakeholder, how do I now fit into all this web yeah, development challenges that we need to address. So, women are that we are going to fit them on another. The experts say the building is a lot of things. Kaka, it's like a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a a uh, the, the very um, good deliberations that we did this on, if money information is in the area, highly, then this is our our sort. Or if it's a whole, so many things are happening around us. They long or they they are they affect that is a hard So how do we also deal with them to make sure that we are not very many are still. Uh, resilient, especially to negative shocks that come from outside. Uh, I would like to say thank you and thank you and thank you very much. Me, I would like to declare this uh, uh, event that we had today. I can't say it's a workshop, we were not working here. It was an event. We were launching and getting knowledge and being equipped with what we need to do. So I would like to to declare it officially opened and closed. Oh, closed! Yeah, you were not like you were not 
Okay, close. <laughs> but it's not close. If we close, we are going to forget. <laughs> yes. So it's still open. Wherever we are, we still think about it. And we <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, may I kindly request you to be upstanding as we sing the national anthem. Daru Kwame. gentlemen you are all invited for lunch and until we meet again please have a very fruitful and innovative weekend